Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee meeting of today's date, which is the 12th of July 2022. Um, just to remind members that the meeting is being recorded and will be available to view on YouTube for any um, residents that want to actually tune in and have a look at that. Um, apologies. We've received apologies from Councillor Peter Thurgood, Councillor Thomas Jay, Councillor Jan Woodrop, Councillor Moira Greatrix and Councillor Dan Maycock. That takes us to item two on the agenda, which is the minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of June 2022. Can I ask if we can have a, a mover and a seconder for that, please? That's lovely, thank you. And take a vote on that by a show of hands. So we'll take that as, as read. Um, Move on to item three, which is declarations of interest. Can I ask if there are any declarations of interest from any of the councillors this evening? No, thank you. Item four, update from, from the chair. I've got a couple of things. Um, the pharmaceutical needs assessment consultation, um, which I believe has gone round to members of this committee, um, just to say that they're looking for comments as we're, we're one of the stakeholders um, and that's open that's running until the 5th of September so there's plenty of time to get any comments or information in there that you, you wish to um, wish to submit um, as you will all know by now we had the meeting um, of the MF, MPFT board last month um, and the recommendation went through the they don't intend to reopen the George Bryan Centre. This is now going to um, the Overview and Scrutiny Committee at Stafford on, I think it's 1st of August, and I'm a member of that. So I'm meeting with the chair of that committee, myself and the vice chair of this committee, Dan Maycock, um, to see a way forward of making our representations at that meeting. So if anybody has anything they want to feed into me before that date, then I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Moving on to item five, which is the update on the housing strategy. I'd just like to say that Councillor Alex Farrell, portfolio holder, and Rob Barnes, the executive director of communities, have both sent their apologies for this, but we're very lucky to have Joe Simmons here. So over to you, Joe. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation um, to review the housing strategy 2020-2025. Uh, um, I was asked specifically to sort of more concentrate on the health and wellbeing, but I think it's useful us to start off with giving uh, members the background to the housing strategy. Uh, and the, obviously I've done a, a, a small PowerPoint there that, that you've got copies of. The housing strategy 2020-2025 um, was actually um, agreed at Cabinet in October 2020. Um, it's not a statutory requirement, um, however it does afford the Council a clear direction of travel and priorities for all areas of housing activity. And it's vital for a number of reasons. It informs our role in the increase in housing supply, it's a place shaping, promotes the role of housing in the creation of safe, thriving and sustainable communities and supports economic growth. So the, the strategy itself um, is, is just an, an overarching aspiration and includes actions contained within other corporate strategies. So they're including, but not necessarily exclusive to, the local plan, the future high streets project, climate change policy, housing allocations, housing acquisitions, affordable rents, uh, homelessness and rough sleeping strategy, the private sector enforcement policy and the overarching community safety plan. So it actually has a lot of um, elements to it. So whilst uh, my service is actually the, the, the one that actually looks at housing strategy, um, obviously it includes other operational areas. 
So the, the, the priorities that were identified, uh, there's four. Um, the, the first one is to enable the provision of sufficient new homes to meet the needs of the existing population and those attracted to the area to work, ensuring a range of provision to reflect both need and aspiration. The second priority is making best use of existing housing and related assets. The third one is ensuring that housing plays a key role in delivering Tamworth's response to climate change. And the last one, which we will concentrate on a little bit later, is to ensure that everyone who lives or works in Tamworth has access to appropriate housing, um, especially with that, that wellbeing aspect to it. So I'll just look at these sort of things, action plans that are uh, uh, running through on the priority one, which is the sufficient new homes to meet the needs of the existing population. Um, we have a joint working arrangement in place to consider and new, ensure uh, new developments are discussed in line with the local plan. So the planners do actually talk to the housing teams and actually other areas of the council. That is in place. Um, we have an allocation of affordable housing on new sites uh, in line with policy and uh, that we, it's made sure there with the developers that there is a variety of options for rental and shared ownership. 10% um, of new sites um, must be some form of affordable housing. Um, we want to make sure that there is a variety of options available for aspirational homeowners. Um, that at the moment is being looked at with planners and also in conjunction with Litchfield and other um, adjoining authorities where the actual new developments are actually part of Tamworth's housing, housing need. And that may include first homes, shared ownership as I've just mentioned. The housing solutions team, which is part of the neighbourhood services, um, for fully engaged in ensuring people that ha on the housing register have nominations rights to new developments. So as part of those agreements, um, the developers will give nomination rights to the housing solutions team for people from our housing registers. The future high street plans, as we know, are in progress, and that includes elements for housing. And the, the council are able to purchase property within the acquisitions policy. Um, to meet needs from a social housing perspective. So priority two, which is best use of existing housing and related assets. Um, members will know of the Tamworth heat, heat service um, provided by Beat the Cold. That's been recommissioned for a further three years um, from 2021 with the option to extend. Um, that service provides um, help to all residents in Tamworth to make homes as energy efficient as possible. Uh, this can range from practical independent advice to financial assistance in the form of grants or loans. Obviously, an energy efficient home is a warmer home, which, which is also hopefully cheaper to heat. Um, it's a bit ironic at this point in time um, and will improve health and well-being. Um, the other project that at the moment we are looking at revisiting empty homes um, that is when the business partnership business plans for 2023-24 to see what options are there to um, bring empty homes back into use. We continue to do the mandatory licensing of homes of multiple occupation and that's ongoing where necessary so all um, private um, houses of HMOs should actually subscribe to the standard licensing um, processes and standards. There is also now a private sector housing enforcement policy in place, which enables support for tenants in their private rented accommodation. So that may include works in default. We, we are we, we're engaged to do works in default for, for filthy and verminous private property. We can issue improvement notices to landlords, landlords for example, for damp and mould, uh, allowing uh, allowing vulnerable tenants to remain in their properties and we can also issue prohibition notices which actually will not will mean that a landlord is not able to rent out an unfit property that's some examples of the, that goes into the enforcement policy priority three um, ensuring housing plays a key role in delivering Tamworth's response to climate change Obviously, members are aware that we, the council's target <clears throat> of becoming net zero carbon for its activities by 2050, with an aspiration to achieve by 2030, so we'll be able to do so. There is a project underway to identify private landlords who are not compliant with energy efficient regulations. 
So that will actually, we, we have the ability to look at properties that are in the private rented sector with an energy performance certificate of E or, a, or E or above to actually make sure they get E or above. So we're doing a project at the moment, we've actually received some funding to actually identify properties that are actually E and below um, to bring those into, into those regulations. There has been a delivery over the last few years, COVID permitting of 23 installation projects in installation projects in Wilnicott and Belgrave, which was obtained through the local authority deal funding. And the warm homes activity um, has included new gas installations, first time gas central heating um, in several areas of Tamworth. And from the housing revenue accounts, uh, there is planned investment in the Decent Homes Plus standard, which actually um, says that homes should be EPC of C or above by 2028. Um, so that's an ongoing pro project within the housing um, departments. Priority four. Ensuring everyone who works, lives or works in Tamworth has access to appropriate housing that promotes well-being. The first action on there was to, to ensure pro providing appropriate information on housing options and, ch and choices. Um, members obviously know that the Tamworth Advice Centre contract was awarded for 2021 to 2025 to Mid Mercia Cab. There is a debt and tenancy sustainments advice in place through that service. The housing options advice is available through the housing solutions team. The Tamworth housing allocations policy was updated in 2021. There is a local lettings plan in place for new developments, so that would be Tinkers Green and Carrier, ensuring access to affordable rents for key workers. There's a range of housing options available on new, new developments, so that's again links to the prior, other priorities. A nominations right for persons on a housing register they may be in lower bands um, so that they, they may have aspirations and actually could actually access the private rented sector and there's also options for shared ownership and also there is right to buy schemes in place the second action on priority four um, to reduce homelessness its causes and consequences there is a new homelessness and rough sleeping strategy, 2020-2025, and action plans in place. Um, there is a homeless prevention grant funding um, available, which will hope look to sustain tenancies either in the social or in the private sector. We have support for vulnerable young people to access appropriate accommodation. There is a review of temporary accommodation completed in place through housing solutions team. So our private sector leasing uh, went at the end of the last financial year and all temporary accommodation is now provided through our social housing. We have a rough sleeping project which continues with Heart of Tamworth, uh, which was funded through the Homeless Prevention Grant and that includes a mental health support worker. And that partnership is extremely strong uh, and, and will continue into the winter with the night shelter provision in winter 2022. And obviously the partnership working in line with the community safety plan ensures that we've got referrals into pr appropriate agencies. So by that I mean, for instance, uh, if we have particularly vulnerable people or a multi-agency multi approach, which includes the need for housing, um, people can be brought into the partnership arena. So the Tamworth Vulnerability Partnership is, is where we can actually look at, look at different cases there. And obviously we have practical support for per persons facing fuel poverty via the Tamworth Advice Centre, Community Together, CIC, and Beat the Cold, obviously will assist there as well. So there's a wide range of, of, of um, things in place for the, the housing and homelessness. The next um, action point on the plan was to increase tenancy sustainment rates, particularly in the private rented sector. We have a, um, a, an emerging project with the Midlands Foundation Partnership Trust to maintain tenancies of residents with mental health concerns who are known to the service. They are just about to appoint within the um, local team of um, M MFP, I, can't, I can never say it, MFP, 
Tea, <laughs> um, a housing sustainment mental health support worker. Um, the one for Tamworth will cover Litchfield and Tamworth and will actually be looking at housing sustainment issues with, say, people who are known to the mental health service. And they will also um, link in with all the partnership meetings there. There is tenancy support and advice for persons acquiring a first property. There is advice available through the Tamworth Advice Centre and the private sector team um, around private rented properties. All homeless people have a personal housing plan in place. There is domestic abuse provision in place um, in accordance with the Domestic Abuse Act, um, where we actually you know, work very well with, with Pathways and New Era. There is support for private tenants around illegal eviction notices and advice for landlords, and we will take action against landlords as necessary. Well, I might go across. Then the, the final one, action on priority four, was to ensure appropriate, appropriate advice and funding is available to support older people to live independently. Obviously, Tamworth Borough Council operates successful sheltered housing schemes for those who wish to live independently. Re recently, the, there has been an age reduction to 50 years for access to sheltered, which hopefully will sustain independent living who are those who are known to have longer term needs so that can future proof their, their housing requirements. The disabled facilities grants are still available through Millbrook and Healthcare and Staffs County Council Adult Social Care. The Disabled Facilities Adaption Grants so that council tenants can actually access additional funding to sustain independent living. And recently, Tamworth has retained our dementia-friendly community status. So that's working with Age UK, Dementia UK and Home Instead to deliver advice, guidance and support for people living with dementia and their carers. So that is a whistle-stop tour. <laughs> of a huge amount of work going on across all areas and it kind of dovetails quite well into that those headings so it's various the last slide is <coughs> sort of future proposed actions um, around what we've what i've just sort of covered that we are obviously as i've mentioned looking to update our empty home strategy to increase sort of housing provision um, we are we, we realize that where there is um an emerging need to look at the older person housing need strategy so that's seeking to understand development needs for older people in our communities and that would have to be within conjunction with Staffordshire County Council um, as the adult social care other registered providers and the integrated care board which obviously used to be the CCG so your health so that is something that we are looking to d develop but maybe um, in, in a couple of years time um, we're looking at determine a criteria for first homes, which is a new homes purchase scheme for Tamworth residents. The new homes proposal of the 10% of affordable housing um, on new development sites, 20% of that 10% has to be a first home, which will offer eligible Tamworth residents, uh, uh, I think, um, an eight purchase price of 80% of the market value of the home. At this point, um, we haven't actually developed fully what that criteria will be. So who is actually el eligible? What, what, what part of the workforce is that like to be? That's something that planning will take forward um, with, with, with ourselves. The, obviously, one of the most important things from my perspective is to continue to develop existing relationships with the voluntary sector to commission wraparound support uh, within housing and to maintain that healthier communities and sustain independent living. And finally, um, we need to develop and look at an approach to the emerging <coughs> needs of asylum seekers and refugees in line with government policies. So those are the um, five sort of streams that we're needing to look at in the future. And I think that covers everything. I, know, I appreciate it very uh, very complex but you know i'm happy to take questions and those i can't answer i will happily take back that's brilliant joe thank you very much for that um yeah 
it, it ties in very nicely with health and wellbeing, what you've actually given us. So um, thank you for that. Um, anybody got any questions for Joe? Councillor Cook. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> it seems rather familiar so for some strange reason. <laughs> No, um, no, obviously I was kind of um, the cabinet member that was um, around at the time when this strategy first got launched. So, um, yeah, it's it's not unfamiliar in any way, shape or form, which is good. Um, I've got three things I wanted to ask if that's possible. Um, so the, I'll go to one of the last things you said first. So on the last slide where you've got your future proposed actions um, and the criteria for first homes, I know you said that that's still obviously under development, but it's something that I would definitely like to see if we're looking at giving people um, admittedly, all affordable homes are usually 20% below the market value. That's the standard for them to be classed as an affordable home. If we're looking at giving somebody a home that's a Tamworth resident and it's a first home and we're giving that 80% kind of price rather than the full market value, great, absolutely support it. My question is, what happens and what's our plans if that person then sells on, are we then actually saying that the person they sell to is a first homeowner and you've got to give that 20% for maturity because it's all very well doing it once, but once that asset's gone, <laughs> that person, in my opinion, shouldn't get a 20% uplift because they could sell it if there is a criteria for five years or whatever it happens to be with a 20% increase, which across the market may not be the same as anyone else. Um, so I'd be asking us to actually recommend to that policy when it goes in that actually we say that that 20% has to then be passed on. So actually that property can then only be sold on to somebody in the same position, i.e. a first time owner who wants to buy who's from Tamworth because otherwise we lose it. So I don't know what the committee's view on that is but that would be my first thing. So I'm happy to carry on with my questions. It's up to yourself, Chair, or do you want to... <laughs> you got do you want to answer that? Yeah, I would. I would. I think that's one of the discussions that I've seen recently on the week. We, because at the moment, the first homes, um, I believe, is something that comes from new developments as of last year. So it's things, you know, that things already in the pipeline may not think, and obviously I'm not a planner, so I would need to defer back to, to planning colleagues on that. But yes, I think that I have seen something around that discussion because there is there is a way that that would need to be managed through the, the land the land letting service to have a look at, because that, that house would have a, almost a charge, not a charge on it, but it would be identified as one that's been sold at 20% of less of the market value. So that would be part of the process, yeah. Yeah, Cook. Yeah, just to kind of come back on that, I know, and it's it's a long, long time ago, but there was a development well before this particular scheme came out. Um, that actually one of my um, well, one of my parents' <coughs> friends' son and um, his wife ended up buying in North Luffingham in Rutland, and that was in exactly what happened there. It was basically it was the local parish council that built ten houses, and it was only ever going to be available for those individuals that were from there so it has happened so there has been case history um on that one but that's the thing i'd love to say thanks okay should we part that recommendation until you've asked your other questions if you're happy with that um so yeah so the next thing i just wanted to say is i suppose we're, i know we're looking kind of what 18 months or so down the line the one thing from a committee perspective that I'd love to see is actually some facts and figures around this, the update and refreshing the committee on what actually is in the strategy is really, really useful. However, we don't know if it's working without some sort of tangible kind of red, green or <laughs> amber stats ultimately. So I know it's not something you can kind of provide us with now, but it, for the next time there is an update or if it's possible to circulate something, I'd like to know kind of like where you've got um, about kind of notices for um, 
HMOs. I know, Joe, you and I have had conversations about this historically, and Tina has and others. Actually, how many are we licensing? How many are failing their checks, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And I think the vast majority of these should ha have some sort of measurable deliverable. So actually, as an amendment for the next time an update comes, and I think this is the same for any policy, don't just give us words, give us, is it working? Because we're meant to scrutinise, and you can't scrutinise if you're not actually told if it's working or not, or evidence to be able to determine that or not. So that was my, that was my second point. Thank you, Councillor Cook. And that was going to be my point, <laughs> that it would like be you nice know, to see some figures to see what actually is happening and how it's being measured. So if we could include that in the next update, that would be great. Thank I think, you. I mean, I'm happy to, to look at what, obviously, you know, at this point we were always asked to bring to, to and so everybody understood that, that could refresh that strategy. Um, I mean, you know, we, we do keep those figures. We can, we can provide a lot. I mean, you know, as I say, the, off the top of my head, and I know that there's 67 HMOs that are licensed, so we know how many we have licensed, how many enforcement actions, I and mean, we, we will be taking that, those back to the Social and Housing Committee as well. Um, from a point of view of other, happy to, to provide what, you know, what performance stats we have for TAC. Um, we have performance stats for Beat the Cold around, you know, for instance, I can update immediately that we, we've had 910 inquiries through Beat the Cold. Um, and of those, there are a lot of statistics around when they provide vouchers for things, when they get put grants through, how many houses have actually been done. Um, yes, we, we do get those figures. So I'm happy to sort of take that. I don't, you know, I don't know whether you want that as on an on an, an annual basis or, you know, that that's obviously part of the committee's decision to do. I can I can certainly take that back. And now that we've got this overarching view to all the actions and actually going back and revisiting, I'm happy to sort of put those stats around those. Yeah, that's brilliant, Joe, thank you. That, can I just go to that 910? In what period of that is that? That's the year. That's the year? Mm -hmm. yep. is, is that unusual? Um, quarter four had quite an increase. Um, that's probably to do with the issues of the, the the fuel at the moment the cost of fuel mm -hmm. so yes it has gone it started in quarter one at 173 and then went up to 381 by quarter four which probably according to beat the cold definitely reflects the situation that we're in mm -hmm. with regards to people worrying about fuel uh, and, and, and the cost of fuel so i'll throw it open to the committee to um put a time on this or do we want it quarterly do we want it every time we have an update I suggest every time we have an update. I mean, I'd, I'd agree, definitely every time we have an update of, on any report, because it's, mm. it's, it's numerous times, and dare I say when I sat on Cabinet, there's numerous times when people would ask that question. Um, definitely, but also I'd say, especially on some of these, on a six monthly basis, mm. but not just a snapshot of that year, going back, things like the heat stuff, so we can monitor those uplifts. Is there a reason why the more should we actually be spending more money on some of these things and actually increasing the resource? It's not just a, oh, why are you doing that that way? Mm. It's an opportunity for us to be able to challenge and actually say, actually, we're spending fifty thousand pound on that hypothetically, and we're not getting really much uplift. Can we do more in a comms campaign to increase it, or actually we're spending fifty thousand pound and you you that's been the same for four years and it's been doing this what more can we do so actually i'd say at least every six months but that's just a personal view okay so the rest of the committee yeah okay okay six months for that i'm sure with the fuel crisis as it is at the minute you know this will just go up and up i would imagine um, it'd be it'd be good for us to see you know what's happening and which areas you know which particular demographic of people are um, are doing. Did you have another question? I most certainly did. So <laughs> this one is about priority three, and again, Joe, I'm not expecting you to shall we say have um, necessarily an answer on this one, um, but maybe more of a kind of a a challenge back to your new portfolio holder and his colleagues mm -hmm. um, to say these priorities and 
these projects have been around since 2020, pretty much. I don't think there's anything that's changed. And we sat in this room a number of years ago, stressing the importance of climate change. And we sit here in just July 2022, just checking. And I do not see that we've moved forward in any way, shape or form on climate change. We keep hearing, oh, we're working on it, we're working on it, or we'll come back to something, but we haven't seen anything at all. And we sit here, and I'm, I sat just over there, absolutely committed to the fact that we should be looking at kind of achieving a 2030 net zero. And the best that we've got on here in terms of a timescale is that by 2028, the decent home standard would be of a C plus. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a big fat fail, <laughs> in my opinion. And we need to be doing far, far more to do this. I know, again, when I sat on the kind of on the cabinet, that Tamworth council stock just to replace however many boilers it was, I think it was 50 boilers or some stupid amount was two million pounds. And we've got thousands of houses. This is some massive, massive investment that's required for our council housing, let alone the rest of the authority. And actually, we're in 2022. We're never in a million years going to do this in eight years if there's, we're two years down the line and still no strategy. So at some point, and again, through the chair, <laughs> of going, we can't just sit here keeping kicking this can down the proverbial road because it's it's a failure on all of us we're going to be in the same position as we've been talking about those shops over the road of when do they get demolished or not and it'll be oh well those people back in 2020 21 22 onwards didn't do anything <laughs> and it absolutely infuriates me we've got pages on what to do with kind of priority four and we've got one measly page on <laughs> priority three and i just think i know it's not your well, Joe, and there's an awful lot happening behind the scenes, but as a council, we need that update. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Joe, do you happy to answer that? Um, I think I'll have to defer that back to colleagues because I think, you know, the, 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 the specific remit for me as my area was that health and wellbeing uh, from, from a priority, and obviously priority three, I recognise it's in there, and I've tried to give some sort of things that we're actually working with the private sector and our... Our, our social housing stock uh, from a climate change perspective but obviously um, that will need to go back and I know that's within the the forward plan uh, and in work that's going on with the climate change policy to bring that forward yeah and, and I completely agree and appreciate that I put Joan's attention in a slightly difficult position there but things like for example by 2020 2030 we will not be allowed to put based on the current kind of talk out of government will not be able to put a gas central heated boiler in and we're going to have to put ground or air source heat pumps in that has an issue in terms of space it has a massive financial impact on our own housing stock which i think is a health and well-being issue and also you can't heat homes in the same way with a ground or air source heat pump because it's a consistent temperature you can't just whack the thermostat up to get a bit of extra heat and actually, for some of the most vulnerable people that are in our in those homes, which they are, that's why they're in council accommodation. It's not the, the accommodation of choice. It's because that's what they need to be in for other reasons. Actually, we're potentially, if those properties are not insulated sufficiently or not designed sufficiently, we're not in a position then to protect those individuals from cold temperatures in the winter and if you're a vulnerable or an elderly person needing that temperature we won't be able to go or oh, let's just put you a gas boiler in because they'll be illegal so actually we're on a very slippery slope to do an awful lot very very quickly so uh, that's kind of an area of expertise and I think it's something we really need to look at and we need to push our cabinet colleagues <laughs> to be actually prioritizing this not giving a spin Absolutely, absolutely. Um, could, did you want to formulate some sort of recommendation on that? I think a recommendation to say for the next health and wellbeing meeting, mm -hmm. we actually have a presentation on what our latest strategy is for the climate change agenda with an action plan of what's going to happen when, um, especially when it comes to things like, I'll say the, the areas that are health and wellbeing. I know this isn't just 
council housing is much bigger than that. Mm. But in terms of our resources, it's a really important one. But mm. I think, yeah, I, I think we should be having every, every meeting, it should be a standard item on our, our agendas to go, where are we? Let's actually hold this to account. Yeah. Council made that priority. Yes. Yeah. And we're not seeing anything. So yeah. words to that effect. Have you got one? Do you want so, me to read some read back what I've got? So and this would be a recommendation to go forward to cabinet if well there's this, two, yes. Well this yeah. uh, with this one, one to start. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um what I've written down is that the next Health and Wellbeing Committee, which I think is scheduled in September, mm -hmm. um, to receive a presentation on the climate change agenda on the areas of, of relevant to the health and wellbeing scrutiny committee brackets social housing brackets or broader than that so um, I'd, I'd personally say it's got to be broader than that but i'd actually like to see an action plan of what is proposed on those things so actually where is the hard deadlines of what what are we going to see and when because it's been worked on for months and I know COVID's obviously happened and that's obviously been a massive priority but we're sitting here unless any colleagues have got any ideas we're sitting here in the dark so we haven't seen anything no. and even if it's a draft paper that's been circulated with kind of the <coughs> senior management team to cabinet to actually say what is the proposed dealing with this and actually if there isn't something and that's if there isn't i'll say that's fine in inverted commas but actually we as a committee need to know that if we're going to hold our deliverables to an to account would be my reckon yeah does that make sense <laughs> can i read yes. that back again chair yes Let's see if i've got it this time um so I've written down now a, a presentation on the climate change agenda, including an action plan of what is proposed in, res on, in respect of areas with a health and wellbeing focus. Does that make enough sense? I'm more than happy to explain it to cabinet if they will want more information <laughs> or if that doesn't make sense when it goes back. So, so we've got a recommendation. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Kingston. All in favour? Thank you. Before we move on to your original recommendation, do either of the other councillors have any questions for Chair? Councillor Kingston. Thanks, yeah, and, it, and I don't think you're going to be able to answer it, Joe. Um, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, on to priority two, you've got make best use of existing housing and related assets. And there's a lovely section at the bottom, and quite rightly so, about private sector housing enforcement policy. And it goes on about enabling support for tenants in private accommodation. Um, should there be something in here that relates to, and I'm sure fellow councillors may agree, because we get an awful lot of uh, patch issues raised through the quality of, of, of council housing stock and um, exactly what we see on bullet point two there the last point bullet point uh, damp and mold and stuff like that so should we be seeing something specifically targeting and coming back to us about especially if we're looking at data about the number of council house properties that we uh, have that do not meet the same standards as private sector housing in line with the same policy. I mean, it, it, I'd even go as far to say, should it be, just be a housing, a, a, sec, a housing enforcement policy that applies equally to whether it's council stock or private stock? Um, it's just a suggestion I'm throwing out there. I don't know what people think about that um, because we do seem to get many of those complaints. I've got another point as well, but I know you here. Yeah. Thank you for your look up. Oh, no, I mean, on, on that particular point, I agree with you entirely. And I think this goes back to a data perspective that actually private sector is slightly different in terms of the fact you have to, you, we, we can't go into a property and just go, well, you need to do it. Sometimes we have to force, so there's different powers to do that. However, it goes back to kind of the data sets of what we've said in terms of actually how many of our own properties do we get complaints on damp, etc. Because again, it is something that we have an awful lot. And is it potentially 
we'd like to think first time we, someone picks up the phone to report it, it gets fixed or there's a process to deal with it? Or is this potentially a bigger issue that some of our housing stock is starting to get slightly old? Yeah. And actually, replacement policies are actually what's required, which is another big issue. We've seen Tinker Screen and the Carriers, the two big regeneration projects that we've demolished and rebuilt because they were not fit for purpose. But then other properties that were built in the 40s, 50s and 60s and 70s may not have been the best in condition wise. And is there a big, bigger issue? So I think I don't necessarily agree with the fact it should just be a housing enforcement policy per se, but actually more data and evidence so we can actually start reporting on those sort of things would be my my take on it. But mm -hmm. Councillor Kingston, mm -hmm. I just agree with you in terms of this is a big issue in terms of damp and mould. Well, thank you for that. Did you want to add something to... Yeah, I mean, I'm quite happy to... to, 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 to I understand totally the different... Um, pieces of legislation that would be need to be brought in. I think just looking at it in context, I mean, you said it, that um, much of our housing stock is now getting very, I say very old, you know, we're talking 50 odd years old plus. And um, at a time when post-war, those houses were put up as quickly and as cheaply as they possibly could be because we desperately needed housing stock at the time. Um, and they weren't for um people in in need the way they are now the criteria was different back then wasn't it you know going into a, a, a traditional council house in the 50s and 60s was very different to going into a council house today so i think it's just a case that this needs looking at from the point of you summed it up beautifully is our housing stock do we need a replacement policy Joe. Yeah. Yeah, I think that obviously the the, the, the 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 housing side of things I would need to defer back to Tina, um, because we, when you're looking at an enforcement, you've got two different duties. You've got your duty as a landlord, so we can't enforce against ourselves. Um, but that 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 would they would they would be that complaints procedure and that process where 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 a tenant actually complains about stuff like that, and I know we are looking at I mean I know that our housing colleagues um, provide information about reducing damp and mould, and in the same way that we we would do the same for private tenants. The difference with the private sector enforcement policy within the housing acts and all the relevant legislation is that we have that statutory duty then to enforce against the private landlords so we we, we you need to keep them separate but the same issues occur so i think we you almost become self-regulating for our social housing because we are the landlord whereas we've got the power for the private landlords it's slightly different so they they, they, they are kept separate for that reason just wanted to say that I think this also ties in with the empty homes, doesn't it? Because you get quite, a, you know, there are empty homes that go to rack and ruin and you end up with mould and vermin and things like that. Um, and it would be useful to have some, like, actual data, wouldn't it, on it, really? Yeah, and again, my second point is possibly something to look at for the work plan. Um, on priority four, ensuring everyone who lives and works in Tamworth has access to appropriate housing that promotes well-being. Um, there's reference at bullet point three to the DFG's Disabled Facilities Grants available. Um, when I've supported residents with regards to DFG's, it appears to be, and we're looking at well-being, incredibly complex to go through that process for somebody who is... Um, perhaps looking for the DFG to amend their property for a, a child or, a, or, or, or another relative or something, or maybe even themselves. Um, could we perhaps do a separate piece, Chair, on maybe getting somebody who knows about the DFG grants in detail to come in and give us a presentation on the process and allow us to maybe scrutinise that. One of the key things that I've come across on three of the cases over the years that I've supported residents with is the, the changes in staff. Now, staff do change, I get that. You know, people move on to other things. But because the process is so complicated and can take a year or more, you know, this one member of staff can start the process off 
They know the project, they know the issues around the individual who's applying for the DFG, and then suddenly that staff moves on to somebody else or somebody new comes along. So the process, in effect, has to be restarted again. Um, it's not fully restarted, but the resident feels that they, oh no, we've got to start again, I've got to tell this person the same story, you've got to produce documents and all that sort of stuff. So just as a future work plan item, maybe we want to consider looking at the DFG grants from the point of view of uh, well-being. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. I'll put it down um, when we get on to the work plan further down the um further down the agenda. Councillor Cook, the, the first recommendation which I've got, um, you wanted an update on the, the data, the actual figures, um, at least six monthly? Yes, I'd said um, six monthly, absolutely agree. I mean, just to kind of add to what Councillor Kingston's just said there about DFGs as an example. How many applications do we get? What's the mm. average wait yes. time? Yeah. Um, how many visits does it take? All of, the, all of that. Now, okay, realistically, have we got the time and resource to sit and go through every single thing? Probably not. But have we sitting at home in our comfort of our living room a week before the meeting to go through and actually is there anything that's sparking interest? Mm. Mm. That's our job. Mm. So actually, it's a scrutinising yeah. to kind of go through it. So getting that and then adding then when we want to, i.e. things like that, actually, do we need to know a bit more about it or have we got questions, then you can pull those things in appropriately. Um, in terms of, so in terms of data, I'd be saying six monthly on pretty much all of these. And Could you get some wording down for that, that first oh. one? Yeah. Yeah. And I know, obviously, <laughs> and again, I should probably know, considering it the quarter of, quarter of performance reviews that has sure an awful lot of the data. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I've got the six monthly. Um, I've got the six monthly. But it's do we would it help to identify the areas that where they want the metrics was what I was in the, the this recommendation. Because six monthly on metrics it's so very open. Absolutely. So I suppose it is, and this is the, the difficulty with this. So in, in here, there are so many different things. Like DFGs is an example. If we would say every single line on here, we wanted that. There is yeah. a, th th I would assume, I'd be slightly horrified if there wasn't still, there wasn't a, um, there was a set of data that's collected that goes into the department into the departments because it's not just one I know that much so actually on DFGs for as an example I would be saying how many what's the budget how many applied for what's the wait time how many have been implemented how many potentially have to be removed etc etc if there is a list of information that we get circulated and they and we can then go oh actually we, we'd like to see this, this and this as well i think it's quite difficult as you, as you know from the other side it's quite difficult to sit there and go oh can we have this can we have that can we have this because there'll be things that the teams have got mm -hmm. can they provide us what they've got and then we can add do we want more or do we want it in a different format but i suppose my only thing that i really am quite keen to see is it's not just a snapshot in time and we don't see a trend because we can't we need, yeah, we need we need the, we need yeah. the historical data. I'm not saying twenty years worth, but no. at least <coughs> two, say three minimum years. Of, say three years, because yes. then you can actually say yes, um, what's yeah. going up and is there any analysis? And of course, that will have included the period when we were all in lockdown as well. So yes. that that will be slightly yes. different, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, but the DFG figures, we could actually pull into the suggestion that we look at that on the work plan, mm -hmm. and whoever comes to, um, that we invite along to to give us a presentation on that can give us the figures on that one. Um, so I'm not really sure which figures we, look, we want to look at. I mean, I, if I look at this report, there's nearly, there's got to be data on nearly every page. <laughs> Yeah. Is it going to be feasible for us to get all of that data? I'm just thinking in my own head here. I mean, do you want data on all the priorities in the housing strategy? 
Is that what we're asking for? Or are we just asking for data on the priorities that we... I mean, bearing in mind, I guess, a lot of it always comes back to health and well-being. Yeah. But are you asking for every priority or just priority four or <laughs> three and four? <laughs> I suppose, I, suppose I, I would like to sit on this committee and not just sit here and have a lovely presentation of, oh, that sounds great, and I've got no idea, is it great or is it horrific or are we doing so good that we should be jumping on top of the castle going, oh, hey. I've got no clue. And I've got a bit of an idea on this because I <laughs> saw a lot of that data while I was in my old position. And actually... Members are not but seeing that here, we haven't and if we're not seeing it, mm. it, yeah. So I think the data exists, and I think for any other report that comes to this committee, making sure that it isn't just a word document of "oh, we do this and we do this." Actually, where's the evidence? And then we can build up a well. Actually, that's really useful. Or actually, we don't care about that. We don't need to see it. And I know that puts more work on officers, and I completely understand that's not necessarily what. We want to do, but we can't, in my opinion, do our role as a scrutiny committee without it. So we need to find some sort of resolution. Just, I mean, for, for, for instance, you know, we do a lot of the data that we have is put into the I was it Pentana or Covalent, our performance, like a, uh, our performance system. Um, you know, hence, you know, I I just received the beat the cold this morning, so that will be logged into 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 Pentana. Um, so yes, the data exists from certainly some of this, this the, my area of working. Mm. Um, obviously, your DFGs would be County Council and Millbrook Healthcare. Mm. Um, you know, your disabled facilities adaption grants, I would imagine where that's gone through and also the funding through the HRA for various different things. And that would be reported back in the in the in the housing reports that go back to, mm. to cabinet and to into the into the um audit and governance committee and so forth. Um so i I'm you know, I would suggest that there are data sets there. Um, and, and I think it was important to make sure that obviously with new members as well, you've now got the headings, you now, you've now got what those priorities are and what kind of key headline actions there are. So if that's something that, you know, we'd have to have that discussion with colleagues, mm. defer back to colleagues and have that discussion about how you wanted that presenting. Yes. So, if I if I put um, it's a recommend it's another recommendation to cabinet <coughs> to receive six monthly reports um, on the action plans under the priorities Politics. under the housing strategy, mm -hmm. including data sets and evidence which are measurable, um, and to include trends to include figures to allow the analysis of trends. Yes. We're happy with that. I'm happy with that. Okay. Let's start. So we need a seconder for that recommendation, Councillor Kingston, and we shall vote on that. <laughs> That's unanimous. Thank you. I don't know when the next meeting is. When is the next cabinet meeting? It's the twenty first of. July is the next cabinet meeting. The cabinet agenda goes out tomorrow. Right, okay. But our next meeting isn't until September, is it? September, I think, the 22nd. So potentially this could go to a later cabinet. It could. Yes. Yeah. 21st isn't going to give us enough time to, to do that. So, um, so yeah. Any more questions for Joe or any more comments or that's the cook? Just to go back to the, com um, the comment I made about the 80% or the 20%, can we pick that one up if possible? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. We need to pick that up as well. So it's, it's actually having something in there that um, that states that it has to be another first-time buyer? I suppose 
ultimately, if that's what we've set it out to be, or that's yeah. what we're hoping to do for the first ones, yeah. I suppose what I'm saying is what I'd like not to see is the very first people get a 20% discount as a first-time buyer, yeah. and then they sell off to the highest Those person people, yeah. that comes yeah. through who might have six houses down the road. Mm. So in other words first time buyer 20% discount and actually keep mm. those properties yes. in perpetuity rather than just a one off. Mm, okay. No, I don't, I it was that question of saying where possible because I know it's happened in other locations. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that narrows down the um, the options then for first time buyers as <coughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry, Chair, is that part of a policy which is under development or is that policy already developed? I wasn't sure. I'm not a planner, so I you know, this is this is the area I've had to look at. Um the I believe it's the government pol planning policy that's came out last year that actually made that criteria for first homes on new build sites of the affordable provision on the site, 20% had to be first homes. Okay. So, yeah, so if, if you've got 10 houses, because they're 10% of a 100 site, of a site, 10% of them are, are affordable provision. So that's 10. Of that 10, two of them have got to be first homes, at least. That's my understanding, and obviously, I will defer back, and that's got to be a criteria within the within that planning. And is that part of policy? I currently or is believe it's in the local plan. It's, in, it's definitely in the planning, the national planning policy framework. Right, okay. Again, that's without having a planner here. I can't completely okay. corroborate that. Okay, so we need to establish, don't we, whether it's actually yeah ongoing or council call. No, I, I agree. I think it's something that if my, my recommendation would be that we recommend that it is considered as an option. Mm -hmm. And if not, why not? <laughs> Councillor Rogers. Thank you. I was just going to ask a Joe question, really. It was going back about the, um, the condition of some of the houses with the damp and the you know, damp, damp and mould. Um, I don't know whether Joe was in, involved with this case, but I had a case in Wilnicott where um, I tried to get something done for this resident and I was passed on to the certain departments to for them to deal with it. Um, and it came back that this gentleman had done her own own fittings into the house which had created the problem i was just wondering if to, if there's a ever a list or knowledge of some of these cases i think is that was that a housing tenant was it one of our housing yes, tenants yeah. that then that would yeah that would need to go back to the the housing yeah, just, just to understand to find it. it, it it's, this, yeah. it's this year i think you was involved because yeah. uh, they told me that i'd got to go through the proper procedure Mm. Uh, in actual fact, I must have got in touch with an officer about it first, mm. and then they passed me on to who to get in touch with, mm. and it came back that they couldn't disclose too much information, but it was because the tenant had done his own oh, right. work in the house, yeah. and he, he now wanted it rectified. Okay. You know, whether it was his, his cost or not, but... I mean, happy if you want to yeah, let well, me know in the details, I can, and I'll, I, I can will. Find it, I'll, I'll find it. I will tonight. pass that on to a relevant department yeah. as, a, as an individual yeah. case. I never had the feedback to to know what did happen. Hmm. So uh, if, yeah, thank you. If Joe's happy to. Yeah, have I a mean, look obviously, at that. I'll, yeah. I can find the relevant person thank and pass you. that through to them okay. with it as an individual case, and and, not, and obviously any any disclosure on the resident, they would have to. You'd have to have the authority to act from them. Hmm. So yeah. yeah. Have we got any other items we want to pick up with Joe? No? That's all that remains, isn't it? Just thank you for coming along. And we shall see you again. <laughs> thank you very much. It was, I, thank um, you. I mean, it was you know, very useful. I think that's that's 
once you once that the understanding of that data now now you've had yes. that overarching i think that's what you, you asked yes. to do and i'm happy to sort of look at what we can develop with with the, the data that we've got that you can we can crunch and put into a report of some information that's yeah brilliant that's thank fine. you so thank you joe i don't know if you want to stay or do you, if you don't mind <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. We'll move on to item six, which is responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. I'm not aware of any of those, so we'll move on to item seven. Consideration of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. There are none of those. So, Item eight. Update on health-related matters considered by Stafford... Staffordshire County Council. Um, the last one was, the well, we had a meeting yesterday, but the last one was the 30th of May that Councillor Jay reported on. Um, there was a meeting yesterday that I couldn't attend for some family reasons, So, um, but I did manage to listen to some of it. And most of it was in connection with the new integrated care boards um, which are replacing the CCGs. So there will be more coming on that. So um, just watch this space and I'll make sure that everybody gets copies of that. So we're moving now on to number nine, which is the forward plan, to consider whether any further items on the forward plan. Oh, sorry, sorry Councillor Cook. Yes, just one quick thing. His paper here about the integrated care plan. Yes. Is it possible at all to get this via email? Just because it's got, if you'd like to subscribe to the bulletin, you can do so here. Yes. There's a click link, and I can't see how to. Yes. Yeah, so, is there any chance of getting that so we yep. can sign up to it? Thank yeah. you. That was my yep. only comment. Thanks. Yes, of course, you'll get all the updates then. Yeah. Um, moving on to forward plan then. Um, I'm not aware of any. I didn't see anything on the forward plan that I thought would be useful to consider, but I don't know if anybody else has. Can I look up? Sorry, this might be a daft question without opening it up. Is anything to do with climate change actually on the forward plan? There is um, infrastructure safety and growth at its next meeting has got, I think it's the next, it's the next book. One meeting, actually, I think, a September meeting. It's got an item before something goes to Cabinet, which is about the baseline report, which has been in progress. So there's something on the full plan on that. And what meeting is that going to, sorry? So there's a net zero carbon baseline reporting item going to the October cabinet and it's down for the 14th of September infrastructure safety and growth and that's the assistant director growth and Gen regeneration bringing that forward which yeah she's been working on for a while I think. I just wonder whether that will include any of the data that we want. Yeah I may have a discussion with the um, with the chairman of infrastructure safety and growth and see yeah and it, if we feel that then we, we still want something something more from them then um, yeah I think it'd be useful I'll, I'll have a chat with the chairman of ISAG if that's you okay with that yeah. more than happy thanks thank you so we now move on to health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan Really haven't got a copy of that. Have you got a copy of that, Joe? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I'm reminded that Councillor Kingston wanted us to add something onto this. So, what have we got coming forward? So 
inpatient mental health pathways and community mental health services pathways. Um, the MPFT, um, at the last meeting, I think we agreed that we would invite somebody from the actual board who made the decision um, and get get two aspects of it to see to see what what's actually going on and what information they've used. Um, I'll probably know a little bit more about that once we have the the meeting in August to see where where that's going. So so that's still on there for September. Yes. Um, the substance that I think that should read misuse instead of abuse. I don't know if anybody else agrees with me. Um, so we haven't got a date for that. Just done the housing strategy. Um, rough sleepers and homelessness is one that we have every year, as far as I remember. So that's in for November. Um, where where would you like me to add in your ideas for the one that you suggested, Councillor Kingston? Um, on the homelessness and housing, really, yes, the disabled yeah. facilities grants. I mean, the September one, I would imagine, is going to be quite a heavy. That's right, yes, it, it needs quite, to be quite sort of... heavy. So I don't think we ought to put anything else no, on that. No. So that takes us, us till November. And we've got um, the rough sleepers yes. piece then, yeah. which is... And perhaps you might want to consider, Chair, putting the winter homelessness relief update into that meeting as well. That's just below it. Yes. Makes sense, doesn't it, to bundle it that really. all together? Yeah, it does really. Sorry. Is it possible just to make a slight um, recommendation there with the winter um, relief one, having an update in terms of what the plans are, and then in kind of one of the later meetings, potentially the March 23 meeting, as you get them to come back again and report yes. how it's gone over the winter period. Yeah. And also in terms of the DFGs, if that went to the November meeting, then that's also coming up to the budget process as well, so that if the, we've got any recommendations for increasing that or adjusting the DFG budgets, mm -hmm. that's bang in the point of actually able to make that provision. That makes perfect sense to me. Sorry to interrupt there, no, guys. No, no, no. So at the meeting following the November meeting, whichever yes. date that is, I would suggest. Yes. What have we got after November? We normally have one in... There's one in the end of January. Yes. If the DF, for the DFG items. Yes. Attainment in schools, that's the working group. Have we anything to... Yeah, I mean, I just need to get moving on that one, get the people together and open it up to anybody else who sits on this committee to, to join the working group. Um, what I wanted to do really was to wait until we got the August data uh, from the providers, mm. both secondary... Um, well, not secondary, sorry, both the sixth form colleges from around that area as well, and the um, South Staffs College, so that we could then start the process of um, looking at what our offer is as a town and bringing something forwards, maybe in the January, February window as well. I don't know if people want that at that time. Okay. Well, should we put to, to be decided on that one because it will depend on how far you have got with the, the working group so we can pick it up on the next at the next meeting when we go through the working groups so it goes through the um, work plan again and see how far we've got with that okay. absolutely no problem at all i could just bring a small update then yes i've got one other suggestion but if you want to come back okay. to me on that okay. or, or ask me what it is what is it <laughs> Um, I've been contacted by a couple of residents to ask um, under health and well-being, and it's particularly relevant to, uh, it sounds as if I might have to declare an interest to me, it's um, down at Tab the old outdoor baths, there used to be an, a, a gymnasium there that was used for um, cardiac care patients and people who were suffering from heart disease and what have you. It closed due to COVID, 
quite rightly so, but hasn't yet been reopened. I don't know whether it's something that can be asked of Cabinet or whether you're going to say to me, well, just ask the question anyway. Was it, was it, a, was it run by? Yes, the Tamworth Borough Council, yep. Yeah. Right, oh, okay. And what's our provision for encouraging healthy lifestyles yes. post not just cardiac incidents, but also any well-being? So if somebody wanted to lose weight uh, and increase their, um, their level of fitness, mm -hmm. do we as a council offer anything for, uh, to support in that, rather than just saying, well, we've got Ballantines? Which is very expensive. <laughs> yes, I think ask the question. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Anything else? No, no, no. No? That was it. I'll ask the question then. Yep, we'll go forward with that. Okay. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we've covered the work plan as well then, unless anybody else has got anything to add to that. All right, which one? Oh, right, okay. On the second page of the work plan, we've got CPR and defibrillator awareness and community engagement. Was that coming into the work plan, wasn't it, that you, the um, working group that you were going to look at? Not necessarily the one I was. That was D Dan Maycock's suggestion, and I just said I'd take it away as I'm one of the trustees of the Tamworth Have a Heart charity and speak to Keith Dawson as of yet. Mm. Um, there's, there's so much with the fitting of defibrillators that we're doing at the moment. Mm. Keith said yes, but can he have the summer to just get in his defibs as much as he can and then come back with okay. more definite proposals? Okay. So we'd like him, like, have a heart to come in at some point? Absolutely. In, in the us. autumn, yes, yeah. but he's, okay. he's just got to put these up on the walls. Okay. At the... So to be advised, that one. Um... Armed Forces Covenant. Working groups performed, um, cabinet member identified Councillor T. Clements. I think that was something that Councillor Maycock was looking at, so we need to see where he's got with that one. And I think that, that covers the work plan. If there's no other business, I shall now close the meeting at 19.12. Thank you all for attending and thank you to any residents that um, may look at this at a future date. Thank you. Thank you.